Because before now, we have been looking at the life of Jesus. First, we looked at his genealogical record. And Matthew, who was once written off, he's not the kind of guy that you would have hung out with. He's a tax collector. He's a sellout. But Jesus includes him. I love that about Jesus. Maybe some of you have written yourselves off. And Matthew is an example of someone that we wouldn't count as having value in society. And yet he bears the image of God. And if he will put his faith in Jesus, everything turns around. Jesus changes everything. And Matthew writes that if you would look at the genealogical record of this guy out of Nazareth, you would see that he is the king. And if you would look at how he was born, how he was born of a virgin, that he was conceived in the womb because of a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, he is speaking to his countrymen. He says, Job, you would know that he's the king. If you saw him in battle, and some of us are all too familiar with what it means to lose in the battle with sin. In fact, if some of us are honest, we're slaves to sin, and he is wanting to fix that. But he says, look at him in battle. And don't get into a legalism that says, I am going to memorize a bunch of verses, and I'm going to do what Jesus did. You missed the point if you did that. You missed the point. What you really want to see is that if he is able, Sheena, to deal with Satan like that, what happens if Jesus is in me? Y'all see that? Because greater is in he that is in me than he that is in the world. Then I too am able to walk in a way that escapes the gravity of my own depravity. I'm able to conduct myself in a way that is consecrated. I am able to say no to sin because Christ in me has broken the shackle, the manacle, the fetter. That's what Matthew's been saying. And after that, we see him recruit a few disciples. And then... We're not going to cover it. It was already covered. There was this Sermon on the Mount. Anybody familiar with Sermon on the Mount? Raise your hand here. Okay. So here's what it really is. After introducing the king, the king is now going to state the character. He's going to state the policies of the kingdom. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. For the United States, we have a constitution, right? And the constitution describes what it means for us to have this nation and what is expected of its citizens and of its government. Does that make sense? After laboring to present Jesus as the king of the Jews, he says now without further delay, the king of the Jews. And Jesus goes up and he sits down. And in Jewish culture, a rabbi sitting down means he's about to teach. And he begins to unpack the tablets. Matthew's also trying to show me that he is like Moses. Moses said, God is going to raise up a prophet like me. And when he does, you hear him. And when he was 40 days in the wilderness without food or water, that was like Moses. Remember? Moses was on Mount Sinai. 40 days, no food, no water. And Matthew's saying, do you see it? This is the guy that was promised. And now, like Moses, he's up on the mountain. And Moses received the tablets you're willing to receive it. Jesus is the tablet. He is the word of God. He speaks with an authority that was astonishing. He doesn't quote Piper. He doesn't quote Ortberg. He doesn't quote Diller. He made Diller and Ortberg and Piper. He says, verily I say unto you. Not thus saith the Lord. Why? Because he is the Lord. And when he comes down from that teaching, People are astonished. They're blown away. It is in coming down from that teaching at the end of chapter 7. That's where we are now. Looking at the power of Jesus to heal. And first, we're going to see Jesus heal a man with leprosy. Some of us would have sent a leper. I am finding out that it is impolite to describe someone as a leper as if that's his identity. He's a person who has leprosy. He's not a leper. That is not his identity. He bears the image of God. He has a disease. He's not the disease. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make, make me clean. And then this next part is really hard to make out in the text because I have stuff covering my slide. I don't know what happened here. Who did these slides? I think I did. And Jesus put out his hand and he touched him saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Leprosy is caused by Hansen's disease, or mycobacterium lepre. It's a very, very slow-growing bacteria. And what it does is it destroys the nerves and the body in a failed attempt to get rid of the bacteria actually begins to jettison its own flesh. It begins to get rid of flesh when it recognizes this flesh is infected with this bacteria and the immune system begins shedding flesh and skin and you lose the ability to sense anything. And on account of not having the ability to feel, people with leprosy, in a sense, they demonstrate almost a supernatural ability to do things. Turn a key that you couldn't turn, but it's because they can't feel. They don't feel the key actually cutting into their skin. Move things that you couldn't move, but it's because they can't feel. Leprosy is a picture of sin. That's what it does. My failed attempt to get rid of sin apart from the work of God actually does more damage than the sin itself. And then sin, over time, is actually creating in me a seared conscience and a deadness to what is real. It's a picture of what it means to have my depravity spread throughout me and slowly kill me little by little. Does that make sense? And here's this man. He's full of leprosy. And Matthew says, behold, whenever you see this behold in Scripture, Matthew or any author is telling the reader, look, you can do something with this. And he is saying to every one of us where the truth is, I am not living right that sin is actually running the show, here is a man with a visible reminder of what sin does. And it also separates. On account of leprosy, you couldn't be in community. And he had to cry out, unclean, unclean. But I love the fact that the man knows one person in which he could have some hope. And he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I love the fact that the grace of God is greater than the good of my asking. The grace of God is willing to give me something greater than what I'm asking. All he wants is to be made clean. And some of us who are actually dealing with an addiction or dealing with a woundedness that keeps erupting in a boil of bad behavior, we're just wanting to be out of that behavior. And all he's wanting is to no longer have these sores all over his body. But what he's asking for is actually beneath what God is wanting to do. Jesus can heal you with just the word of confidence. This man has wounded James beyond just in his body. When things are going bad, how many of us begin to wonder, does God love me? Nobody? Nobody wonders that when you get a series of bad things happening. Come on, we got a few honest people. Some of us don't wonder that, but some of us do. When this relationship fails, when I've got this issue in my body, when I'm rejected by these people, and we begin to wonder, who is it? Who begins to wonder? Does God love me? And this wound is deeper than his leprosy. And Jesus does something. He touches him. And what he's trying to say is, I don't just want you to be clean. I want you to be close. Amen. 
I don't want you to just be without these sores in your body. I want you to be sanctified, set apart unto me. I want to enjoy a special fellowship that is not legalism. It's not religion. It's not your denomination. I want you to know I'm in love with you. And nothing is going to separate me from you. And this ugly disease that you have is not so bad that it keeps me from wanting me to put my hand on you. Y'all see it? For those of us who are dealing with a sin that we hope nobody ever finds out about. Nobody ever finds out that I am looking at Spongebob at 3 a.m. in the morning. And you know why I'm saying Spongebob. Finding out that I am dealing with all kinds of shortcomings and I don't feel fit for fellowship or worship or anything and I can't fathom the idea that if you knew the truth about who I am, that you would love me. Jesus does, though. Why was this written? Because if you don't look down and shake your head, shaking my head at the man with leprosy, some of us have to admit, I'm the man with leprosy. And Jesus is demonstrating what he's willing to do for any of us. And he tells a man, don't tell anybody. Go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. We often think, Richard, about what we want. What I want, right? I'm often thinking about what it is that I'm wanting God to heal in me, Mitch. God, would you heal this? Would you fix this? And so often is the case that I get what I want and then I'm gone. Peace! Jesus, peace, man! You know I love you. I'll see you around Easter and Christmas. You know I love you. I'm going to visit my small group once, twice this year. You know I love you, Jesus. I'm a tithe. No, I'm not a tithe. I'm going to give you something. I'll give a dollar. You know I love you, Jesus. Why are you laughing? Because we do that. We don't ask. Well, what do you want? I know what I want. I'm asking for what I want. You know what he wants? He wants a wellness that is actually dealing with the fact that I'm wounded in here. Because if I don't deal with that wound, it is going to manifest itself in coping mechanisms. A lot of people just get caught up in trying to stop the sin and they never ask, why did I do that? Why? Right? And then it's just sin management because I'm not dealing with root causes. What does Jesus want? He said, can I get a witness? Can I get somebody who not only will admit that I need help and you're the only person who can help me, but when we get beyond that and you are right now, you have been healed now, you're able to stand up now, you're able to walk now, you're able to talk now, you're able to be in fellowship now. He said, what I'm wanting you to do is tell somebody. Go back to that leper colony. Tell them. Go to the priest. Tell them. In this case, he just wants him to go tell the priest. There has never before this time been a Jew healed of leprosy with the exception of Miriam, Moses' sister. And she just got in trouble because of racism. You can go read that in Numbers chapter 11 and 12. No Jew. Naaman, the Syrian commander, was healed. He's not a Jew. We've never had a Jew healed. And if this man just did what Jesus told him to do, right? If he just did what Jesus told him to do, when he went in there to offer what Moses said, they would have said, well, I mean, what are you doing? You only do this if you've been healed of leprosy. That's what I'm saying, bro. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. But you were healed of leprosy? That's what I'm saying, man. I was healed of leprosy. And then what you're supposed to do is talk about Jesus. Amen? And that's what God is wanting us to do when we're, deal, when we're delivered from our leprosy. Right? Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. What Jesus was wanting to do, he was also serving notice. He was telling the priesthood, the king has arrived. John the Baptist told you I was coming, I'm coming. Eventually he is going to show up in the temple. It's not going to be a good thing. He's going to whip it. 
He's going to whip it good. But he started to let him know I'm on my way. Somebody with unusual abilities, somebody bringing a deliverance into Israel has finally arrived. They told me I was coming up here. Ready or not, here I come. Moving on from there. Jesus heals the centurion's servant. Dan, I just want you to note that it says I have 60 minutes. I just, right? Now, I don't know if it's because they're not saying amen or what. I, okay, I'm just saying, I'm going to preach. <laughs> so we have Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 9. Now Jesus had entered Capernaum. Remember, he's no longer in Nazareth because in Nazareth, when his people found out that he had the audacity to bring the blessing of the Jews to people who are not Jews, they tried to kill him. You think we invented racism? You think we invented sick nationalism? We didn't invent that. It's always been there. It's an outworking of a depraved heart. It has nothing to do with a particular ethnicity. And so he goes into Capernaum, and a centurion, this would be a Roman soldier, over at least a hundred, came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. The word servant there is not your normal Greek word, doulos, it's pais. It could be son, but it is more likely, in this case, based on the parallel account in Luke, it is more likely someone who is very, very dear to him and young. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. There are some translations that have verse 7 as an astonished question. They have Jesus saying, shall I come and heal him? And they base that on the fact that, as Peter said, it was unlawful for a Jew to keep company with Gentiles or go in and have fellowship with them. And so based on that, some have said this couldn't have been what he said, that he actually said it as an astonished question. But if you read the account of Luke, this centurion has actually developed a reputation. He sent the Jewish elders and they said he loves our nation and he financed the building of our synagogue. He's already a proselyte. He's already bought into Judaism. There would not have been a problem with him going into his house. You can read that in Luke chapter 7. The centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. The centurion has authority, and he understands that when an organization is running well, it doesn't matter how gifted you are, you have to delegate things. You have to hand some things off. And a person with authority, right, doesn't go out to do everything themselves, that they actually delegate some of that. They send it out. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 28, thus says the Lord, none of my words will be postponed anymore, but the word which I speak will be done. You know, the word of God goes out and it accomplishes what he set it out to do. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken? And will not make it good. And this centurion already figured out. I don't actually have to go and do everything. I can just say, hey, I need this done. And it gets done. I can say, go here. And they go there. There's a song that kids sing. I too am a man under authority. Y'all know what? I say, come and he come. I say, go and he goes. I too am a man under authority. Just say the word and I know you'll be healed as I go. Y'all never heard that? Yeah, it's a kid's song. It's a kid's song. It's a little kid's song. That, y'all don't know because it's on 98.5 The Beat. That's why y'all don't know about this song. It's on 96.1. Y'all just listening to Caleb. Yeah, see, I don't find everything over there. This man gets it. Your word just need to go out. I just need to believe your word. Rich said, not to do I really believe your word. 
if your word go out. And in some cases, his word has already gone out. He's already said who you really are. He's already declared that you are healed. He's already declared that you are delivered. It's a matter of receiving that word. Amen? Amen. That sin no longer has dominion over you. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, this is the word, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? I need to receive that word. Amen? And as that word is received and I meditate on that word, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, there is any virtue or anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. If I would do that, give myself entirely to them, that word is not going to return void, right, Rich? It is going to accomplish in me the purpose for which he sent it out. And this man already gets it. He's not even a Jew. I too am a man under authority. Y'all sing it? I say go and he goes. I say come and he comes. I too am a man under authority. Just say the word and I know you'll be healed as I go. So what happens? Going on from here, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And this is a man who literally created the universe. What does it take to make Jesus marvel? Which is not always a good thing. Sometimes he's in the village and they don't believe. And Jesus is like, wow. <laughs> when Jesus heard it, he marveled, wow. And said to those who followed, assuredly, literally, I mean, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, not even in a people who have been tutored, mentored, guided by the law, where they should have been the paragon. The example of great faith. I haven't found it even there. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He uses this expression of east and west to refer to people who are not Jews enjoying fellowship that has been given to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. But the sons of the kingdom, those who, if it were just genetics, would have been it, but it's not. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. A couple of things we want to see here. There is not a lack of ability on the part of Jesus. Mark 5, 6, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed and he marveled. Remember what I said, it's not always good when he marvels? When Jesus goes, wow. Wow. Wow, this is not good. He marveled at their unbelief. He marveled that having received the Torah, having received Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel and Daniel, having received Ezra and, and all these other scriptures, having a heritage of God working in their midst, he marveled because of their unbelief. Matthew 13, 57 through 58. So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do mighty many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So now I'm realizing it's not a lack of power, it is a policy. I'm not going to do it. Well, if you did a work, I would believe a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after his son, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of John. I give you a sign, it's not going to engender faithfulness, you're going to need another sign, then you're going to need another sign, then you're going to need another sign, right? So I'm not going to do it. What does he want? What the king wants? He wants faith. The Lord is trying to find faith. Why? Believing is actually the basis for things getting better. I can get my vision fixed. I can get my teeth fixed. Actually, I did get my teeth fixed. I got braces, and then I didn't wear my retainer, and then it's getting all jacked up again. It's a very shallow fix. 
Sometimes we get things more serious. And I don't say this with any humor at all. There's cancer. We get things more serious. And we want to be fixed. We get things that literally over time take a person out. But I just want to remind you, the fix is temporary. Lazarus was fixed. You remember that? Lazarus was fixed. And he wasn't kind of sick. He wasn't just kind of down. He was dead long enough to stink. And Jesus fixed him, but the fix was not an end. It was a means. He only did it with the goal of helping people believe. Belief is the way to a better that is lasting. Faith is the way forward to a future where I am forgiven and where I will have eternal life, where I will run and not get weary, walk and not get faint. I will eat as many carbs as I want, and I won't struggle to get in my pants. Faith, this is a very fragile existence. In fact, creation has been subjected to futility. It's not going to get fixed. Every now and then it will get a little bit better, but the reason why is so that ultimately I would believe. And that's what he said. What is the other thing the king wants? Fellowship that lasts. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Finally, there's Peter's mother-in-law. When Jesus had come into Peter's house, so he's healed the leper, and now he's healed the centurion's servant, and he did it from a distance, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. Here's a self-assessment question. And it's no accident that Matthew tells us about what she does immediately. Do I want wellness? I look at John chapter 5, not everybody actually does. Jesus asked a man, do you want to be made well? Man, why don't you ask me a question like that? You know, I'm trying to get down here, and then somebody dives as a ganger into the pool before I get in there. Way too many words, yes or no. And then he heals the man against his will and illustrates that he didn't actually want to be made well. Ask yourself, do I really want to be made well? The Lord already knows the answer. And if the answer is no, he's ready graciously to work with me in that. Why do I want wellness? Is it about the glory of God? Why do I want wellness? If I were well, who is helped when I become healthy? If I had health again, who would benefit from the fact that I can slam dunk? Okay, maybe that's an excessive example of health. Who would be helped, though, if my health were restored? Is it really just for me? Is it because I don't like being uncomfortable? I don't like being in pain. If God did fix my marriage, if he did fix this wound in my heart, if he did rectify this thing in my body, who would actually be a beneficiary of the fact that now it's been made right? What am I doing with my current level of wellness? Paul had a thorn in his side. He got a lot of theories about what the thorn was. I got 60 minutes in. He had a thorn in his side and he prayed, Lord, Lord, please get rid of this thorn, and I'm pleading with you, and finally God says, Bob, said, okay, okay. And that's when he tells him, the thorn, yes, that was my idea. What? Do you realize, Paul, that I have done a mentoring and a discipling in your life that will make you arrogant? And I gave you this to keep you humble. My grace is sufficient for you. You can do what you need to do. You can preach, you can teach, you can lead. And yes, you are somewhat hindered, but you are still more than a conqueror through my grace. And some of us, believe it or not, God has actually got you where he wants you. That's hard to hear. That God, if you would just deliver me from loneliness, that if you would deliver me from this disease, if you would deliver me from this hindrance in my life, he said, that hindrance is actually keeping you broken. 
Because apart from your brokenness, there will never be a breakthrough. I can't use you. Doesn't matter how fast and strong a horse is until it's broken, it's useless. It's just dangerous. Keeps me broken. Amen? Wrapping this up on account of the many signs and wonders that are being dropped in my spirit from the back. Amen. <laughs> what the king wants. Working for others. Service. The wellness given by Jesus makes her fit to do what she wants. It didn't say that Jesus called her and asked her to serve. She wanted to serve. And you and I were created to serve. Ephesians 2.10 for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then I look at Jesus, Acts 10, 38. He went about doing good in the power of the Spirit, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He was doing good. If God does decide to deliver you from what it is that had you set back, then what he would have you to do is, first of all, be a witness, turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor. See, when they say it like that, Dan, I get five more minutes. I'm serious. I can't rap like that. I can't rap like that. Turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. I'm going to be a witness. Being a witness is not about you being well. If you believe in Jesus, you already been. Being a witness is about, not about you getting what you want. But if God decides to fix this issue, then you are not in a witness protection program. You go tell somebody. Amen? You go tell them about Jesus. Turn to your neighbor say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. We go serve. It is, <laughs> it is not God's desire that I would merely be in a life group or merely come to church. God is wanting you, if I really say I'm following Jesus, Jesus is washing feet. If I'm following Jesus, Jesus is touching people I would never touch. If I'm following Jesus, he's going places I don't go, talking to people I don't know. If he's going to make you well, then you're going to serve. Amen? And it's not a burden, it's a joy. It's a joy to serve. There's a significance I feel, not from the accolade or the applause or the approval, but his spirit in me testifying, Rod, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Amen? Amen. Can't even explain it to you. If you're here today and you realize that you are not well, what God is wanting is a wellness that is deep and wide. It's deep because it goes down to the source of all the problems, and that's the depravity that is literally our nature. And he is not so disgusted by my failure that he is casting me off. He's actually calling me in, and he said, my blood dealt with it once and for all. Will you receive it? It goes deep. But it doesn't just go deep, it goes wide. The wellness that Jesus is going to give is going to go for all eternity. You will be well forever. Amen? Lord God, thank you for this time together. My prayer is that this word has been received, that we are not satisfied, sat, settling for a temporary wellness, but we are going first and foremost for the wellness that comes from us putting our faith in Jesus and receiving you, eternal life and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we all said... Yeah.